All right, hello and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bocor, your host on this cool December morning here as I have a new car review. Thanks very much for tuning in. I appreciate it. Uh, as always, taking the time watching my YouTube channel. Certainly appreciate it for this review of a plug-in hybrid vehicle. Now, I don't do a lot of them, but I was asked by, uh, contacted by uh, FCA to look at this uh, 2022 Jeep Grand Cherokee. This is the Overland trim 4xE, and the 4xE indicating that it's a four-wheel drive electric uh, and capable of some off-road. So if you go back several episodes ago, sometime early this year or late last year when I did the Jeep Wrangler 4xE, which was their first plug-in hybrid on the Jeep series, this is the second one of that series. So based on the Grand uh, Cherokee platform, I believe it's a similar platform to the Jeep Wrangler, just they move the batteries a little bit differently uh, in this vehicle because they have more room. So um, let me tell you about some of the pros and cons of a plug-in hybrid vehicle. You know, some people say, hey, why aren't you just doing all electrics, which is the majority of my reviews. However, there are some good plug-in hybrid vehicles out there that are great stepping stones for folks that maybe don't want to do the leap all the way to all electric at this point in time for their use case. So I get it. So that's why I want to look at some competent plug-in hybrid vehicles from time to time. And I think this is one of them. So let me get right into the review. Now, of course, I'd be reminisced if I did not thank Jeep Canada or Fiat uh, Chrysler or uh, FCA Canada, I guess, whatever the acronyms are. I want to thank them for the use of this press vehicle for a few days. Now, as far as the design goes, I mean, I'm not going to go through a lot of design elements here. This is a newer look for the Grand Cherokee that I'm uh, made aware of, and it, it is distinguishable as a Jeep product, right? It's got the, the same grille. Uh, aspects as the regular Jeep products, the same form and function, that boxy look, but somewhat smoothed down on the curves and on the corners to give it a little bit more of an aero feel. In fact, there's an aero indicator on the dash as far as the right height goes to tell you where you are if you're a little bit more aerodynamic than if you raise this thing high now. Because this is off-road, this can go uh, another width of my hand, another three inches higher with full off-road mode. So it has an air suspension that will lift it. So it's quite quite high. You need almost a step ladder to get in and out of this thing. But um, besides that, it looks just like a, a regular non-plug-in uh, hybrid Grand Cherokee model. And I think Jeep uh, owners that have these products today will enjoy that knowing that they'll be comfortable getting into a very familiar product. Now, this is a full-size SUV. It's a big vehicle. In fact, it's so big, I couldn't fit it in my garage straight in to park it. I would have to go in on an extreme angle and only be able to fit one of the two vehicles that we have or, the, or take up both parking spots in my garage. And it's my house is a standard two-car garage with a big single door on it, so it's probably about 19, 19 to 20 feet wide. And I have a longer part in my garage and a shorter part because of the, uh, the, the way the interior of the house is. And I couldn't fit this in in the long part and still close the garage door. So this is a big vehicle, just shy of 5,000 millimeters in length. So you got to take that into account if you're looking at that. But, you know, most people will get a full-size SUV because they want comfort for five passengers. They want cargo space. They want towing capacities. They want the room. They want to sit higher. They want to feel safer. They want all-wheel drive all these kind of elements. And this vehicle does deliver all that. Now from a cargo space, I'll put the numbers up here on what the cargo capacity is. That is of course a power lift gate. Uh, there's massive amounts of space uh, with the, the seats uh, folded up. There's still a ton of space. You could almost lay somebody across there diagonally. It's that big. There's not a lot of room underneath, but it does have a, a, a spare or a fair size spare tire on here uh, with the, the room for the, for the charging plug as well. You get a standard 110 plug on this because this is only level one, level two charging. It does not support DC fast charging. So you just get your level one charger. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit as well. So ample space, you know, you've got towing. This has the towing package on it. It's a two inch hitch receiver. Uh, I don't know what the tow rating is, uh, but you can look that up on the website, but certainly substantial enough to pull a good amount of loads uh, in uh, everyday use. <clears throat> Now, because this is a plug-in hybrid, it does have a conventional internal combustion engine. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. The, this particular one is a 2-liter I4 uh, turbo engine, which, of course, provides power to the vehicle, provides power to charging the battery, 
and it will work in conjunction with the transmission and the way that the PHEV architecture is on this platform to send the power where it's needed. In fact, most of the time when I was not driving in all electric mode, because you can force this vehicle into that, I was driving in what's called hybrid mode, which meant the engine would run and move the vehicle to a point, it would send a little bit of charge to the battery so that when you stop the engine would shut off. So your typical hybrid modes that you see today in non-plug-in uh, vehicles, that's the mode it would run in. So it would continue to try to conserve fuel as much as possible and utilize the electric platform, but with no really large increase in battery percentage while you're driving. It stays around 1% of the battery when it's in hybrid mode. <clears throat> you can force it to battery save mode, which means the engine will run all the time and will, will not only drive and move the vehicle, but it will actually send a charge to the battery. And then when the battery gets to a point where you want to disengage that and run back on battery only, you can make that switch. Um, I'm not sure about seeing value in that because you're using the engine for a longer period of time. I think the hybrid mode out of the two, out of that and the gasoline mode, uh, is the hybrid mode is the better mode. So I would probably use that one if I had this vehicle. But what I did from a driving perspective is I plugged it in every night and charged it to full um, and then was able to utilize a good majority of my driving in all electric mode utilizing that format. Let me talk a little bit more about that. Okay, it's chilling out here, folks. I'm trying to get through this. Now, again, plug-in hybrid, what I talked about at the top of the show is I try to look at hybrids that have a big enough battery to do a good majority of daily use case and, and hopefully even all of the daily use case. And most daily use cases are driving from home to work and back or doing errands around if you're a stay at home parent or whatever, you know, taking the kids here and there, picking them up. Usually it's about 30 to 40 miles. So let's say 50 to 60 kilometers, that kind of thing range on an average. You know, you check out, you Google those figures, you'll get some different numbers, but 30 to 40 miles seems to be a, a nationwide average that people can accept. As an example, if I go from home to work and back, it's 52 kilometers, about 26 kilometers each way. That's just, and I do that a lot. Sometimes I'll just go to work, come home, and I don't go out again. And this vehicle will not cover that distance, even in nice summer temperatures, but now with the winter, right now it's minus one degree Celsius. Um, it's, it's losing some range, obviously, 20% or so, which is the normal winter range. Because it's a plug-in hybrid, it does have a charging port here, right? And it, it's just a J1772, nothing fancy here. And it comes with that mobile charger. Now, I just used that for the entire few days that I had this vehicle. I didn't use my level two because I had a hard time trying to get this thing into the garage. I decided just to use the mobile charger that comes with it, which is just a 110 plug, right? Nothing fancy, don't need a machine, don't need to install anything, you just use it. And I plugged it in every night. Now on that mobile charger, the wall charger, it needs about 12 hours to fully charge from empty. This has a 17 kilowatt battery. It's a 400 volt lithium ion system on here. Um, so you do need about 12 hours or so to fully charge it. Now, most of my time I had, once I got home, like, you know, 5.30, 6, 6.30 at night, I don't leave till after seven in the morning. So I do have a 12 hour window. And a lot of people can do that. If you have workplace charging, you can plug this in at work on just a standard wall plug. If they happen to have an external plug outside or a charging station at level two, this will, uh, this will charge in about two to three hours on level two. So you could, in theory, charge this quite a lot at home the concept is charging it overnight and there's no infrastructure so you just plug it in even outside plug it into an outside plug right a gfi uh, grounded plug that you have on the outside of your home or establishment and you can charge it that way so by doing that i was able to utilize the all-electric uh, battery and powertrain as much as possible without trying to sip fuel that was my goal for this week so i'm going to put up a little bit later after my driving impression some of the numbers and how this uh, worked out because uh, the one good thing about the display in the computer in here is it actually keeps track of how much miles or, or kilometers in this case i'm driving on all electric and how many kilometers i'm driving on gas and it shows you that it actually shows you on the display when your engine's running and when the when you're on all electric mode that kind of stuff so it's pretty good to be able to track that system and um, i'm going to get to some of the numbers at the end as well to show you a little bit more about why something like this can still meet a lot of use cases and it can still be financially 
beneficial to you. So um, just to finish off on the power side of this, I mentioned that two liter engine uh, combined they have with the electric powertrain 375 horsepower and 470 pound feet of torque. So it's got a good amount of go. Now this is a heavier vehicle, so it takes it needs a little bit more juice to get it going. And one thing I noticed is if you want full power, you need to floor it. You need to step put that accelerator all the way to the floor for the engine to kick in to give you that power boost because you don't get it from just EV only. The maximum output that I could see on the display here was around 80 to 85 kilowatts of power in EV only mode when the engine was not running. And that's a good enough power to get you going and to get you up to speed. But if you really need to hammer it for some reason, you need to floor it and engage that uh, engine if you're in electric only mode to get all the power. Now that I've talked about you know, the looks, um, let me show you a little bit about the inside and show you some of the appointments there. Now you folks know I always try to look at the back seat room. Well, this should be a no-brainer as far as back seat room. There's a nice big entry door. It's not, of course, 90 degrees as you can see, but fairly close, but easy to step up. I have this down in normal mode, so it's in the lowest height setting. No problem getting in. There are grab handles if you need them. I've got the seat to, uh, actually it's in easy exit mode, so the seat's all the way back because I have that engaged. Normally my seat would be a couple of inches uh, farther up, so I would have more than a fist of leg room. Lots of height room, more than a fist of height room, very comfortable. These seats do partially recline. They not only fold flat, but they do recline. Uh, let's see, they go back, oh, about there. So that's probably 15 or so degrees. So it's a nice, if you wanted to nap here, you can. You can recline these a bit. It's a very comfortable environment, certainly for four. You can put five in here fairly comfortably. It's not that skinny in the middle. There is a transmission hump because this is an internal combustion vehicle that they've added some electrified components to, right, with the, with the battery pack and some and electric motors and such. So you do have the transmission hump here, so whoever's sitting in the middle in the back is going to have to put their feet across it and be a little bit cramped more than it would be if it was a flat floor. Otherwise, a very comfortable interior. As you can see by the front interior here, it's very nice as well. Uh, the Macintosh stereo apparently is extremely high end and uh, it's a very good um, stereo, the Macintosh. So um, something that I wasn't aware Jeep had. But as you can see, it's got a nice panoramic roof with a shade. Uh, again, the nice seats, uh, good size center console, easy for cup holders. Your uh, iPhone charger is right there in the gap. Everything's laid out very nicely in here and very useful compared to a lot of other vehicles that I test. So uh, well done, uh, Jeep, on that. So now that we've explored the interior, let's go for a quick drive. All right, so I'm just gonna give you some of my driving thoughts here. I won't spend a lot of time on this. Um, you know, I'm not a Jeep um, user, never really owned a Jeep product. I'm not a four by four person, um, you know, from an outback perspective, trying to get uh, to go all wheel driving um, and that kind of stuff, trail, trail riding and such. Um, but obviously, you know, for a larger family or somebody who lives on the country that needs some height, needs some of that 4x4 four four, uh, capability, um, this is a vehicle that's going to do it, right? Jeep builds rugged vehicles. They build very solid vehicles. I mean, the fit and finish on here is very nice. The appointments, the luxury. This has an upgraded, a lot of options to add some luxury upgrades to it. So it's going to be seen in the driving comfort uh, perspective of this. Um, suspension eats up the holes, you know, you get thrown around a little bit, of course, because it's a big vehicle, um, but it works. Now, right now I'm in all electric mode because I've just, you know, I just came here from charging the vehicle up overnight. So I've got about 62% still of the battery left with about 25 kilometers of all electric range. So I'm in all electric range. So what that gives me is a quiet ride. You can hear I've got just the climate on very low. So a very quiet ride without the engine and also uh, uh, all electric acceleration, which is okay. You know, as I mentioned, I'm seeing about 80, 85 kilowatts of peak power when I, when I you, before the engine kicks in. So it's got that. Um, again, you're gonna hear some road noise because these are big tires. You're sitting higher, you're kind of a box. You know, it's not that aerodynamic going through the wind. So as you go faster, you're gonna hear more noise and feel, feel that. Uh, but it's a comfortable big vehicle, right? You have to remember that this is a big heavy vehicle and you will feel it in driving. But as far as all EV operation, it's very nice. Now, from a regenerative braking perspective, it does have regenerative braking in it. 
um, but it's just set at one setting, which is, I guess, a, the strongest setting that they allow. So it does not allow for one pedal driving when you're in EV mode. It will take you to almost a stop, but then you're going to have to um, hit the accelerator. Uh, you're going to have to use the brake pedal, excuse me, to stop the last little bit. So it almost does that. But you can see on the screen as well when you're regener when you're getting some energy back to the regenerative braking it, that it's feeding into the battery. So it does show you the graphs and you can have this screen that I have on here showing the power flow, uh, electric modes, all that kind of stuff and what's coming in. So right now when I let off the accelerator it maxes about 32 kilowatts for a second of regenerative energy coming back. So it's not too bad. It's pretty good. And as I said, now it's now just the last couple of feet, I have to hit the brake to stop. So it almost takes you to a full stop. Other than that, you wouldn't really know that this is an electrified vehicle, right? Other than having those components of being able to run in EV only mode and with some aspect of regenerative braking, you would not know at all that this is an EV vehicle. <clears throat> Obviously the transmission is different when you're in EV mode because it's running directly from the, uh, the batteries um, to to the wheels uh, in a single speed fashion, I believe, because um, you can feel the shift points when the engine kicks in and uh, then you're back at the normal automotive automatic range. So, you know, other than those little nuances, you're really not going to experience much difference uh, if you're already a Jeep user or uh, an owner of an SUV of this class, of an internal combustion vehicle SUV of this class. You're, you're, it's going to be a very similar experience. So the benefit is getting into the habit of charging as much as you can with your with your just your your normal charger and utilizing um, electric mode as much as possible that's going to be the secret to success uh, in this particular vehicle so uh, that's about it i'm going to you know show you i'll show you a little video here of the lane keeping and the adaptive cruise that i did at night time but otherwise that's about it all right so here in the grand jeep or the jeep grand cherokee that's what i'm trying to say I, i'll thought I'd try the lane keeping and adaptive cruise at night here because this road's pretty clean and um, you get to see some of the instrumentation. So I'm going to go ahead and press the resume because I had it active. So I had it set for 72. So as you can see by the HUD there, it's picking up speed and then you have the green um, symbol with the road, with the spacing, and then the green, the steering wheel. Now see how it, I, I tug on the steering wheel, it goes green and then right away it kind of goes yellow afterwards. Um, so it, it's, you have to really kind of keep your hand resting on the steering wheel or, or keep very attentive to it. Um, there's an indicator as well on the dash here, as you can see when the steering wheel goes amber, that means it's starting its countdown. Um, and as you can see around the binnacle, it's green illumination, which means that you're in lane, uh, adaptive cruise control, um, not necessarily lane keeping mode, but adaptive cruise. Um, so when it's green, but as far as the lane keeping goes, it's doing quite a good job. I'm, I've let go now and I'm just gonna let the wheel count down a bit until it really starts beeping at me, but it's keeping uh, the vehicle centered quite well in the lanes. Give you a message here, put to place hands on steering wheel and then might even do it audible. So I did grab the steering wheels for a sec. But as far as keeping uh, on the lanes here, they're well marked, it's a clean street, it's at night. It's doing a really good job. So um, uh, it's a nice system. Uh, from that perspective it's just a very short like you can't leave your hand off for more than 10 seconds and then it's going to start bugging you and bugging you so it's a really short delay time frame on that but as far as the um, a lane keeping capability goes it works very well I've got, it's got the automatic high beams which automatically switches to low beams when it detects a car in front working pretty good here uh, on this uh, again two lane country road it, they just went on now they just went off again because it detected the car as it went uh, down that little gully. Uh, so anyway, as far as the lane keeping, I just thought I'd do something different, show you it at night as opposed to the daytime like I usually do. And just to show what the capabilities are for this, that it's able to uh, stay in lane uh, quite nicely. All right, so I hope you enjoyed all that information. Now, I didn't want to go into a lot of detail on this because, again, you know, the Grand Cherokees have been around a while. The internal combustion vehicles have been around a while. So this is basically an internal combustion vehicle just with some electrified uh, components, again, with a battery pack and some motors to give you that plug-in hybrid capability. So I really kind of like to focus my reviews more on that side of it. So here's the chart with the numbers as far as how I was able to get from a range and driving capability 
So as you can see, I was able to drive a good amount, in fact, the majority of my driving habits for the few days that I had it in all electric mode. And that's with charging every night through the 110 plug and just charging it overnight and getting a full charge every day. So maximizing the amount of battery use that I could to force the car into all electric mode, use that up and then the engine would kick in and drive in hybrid. So as you can see, I was able to be very successful and get a majority of that. But in many use cases that might involve longer distance driving, right? The rated range on this is 42 kilometers of all electric range. So it's not that much for most circumstances, to be honest with you. It gets you about three quarters of the way there and then you'll need to use gas. So one thing I would have liked to seen in this vehicle is over a 20 kilowatt pack anyway, 20 or 21 to get that Oh, 60 kilometer ish range estimate, you know, 45 miles. As I always say on most plug in hybrids, I'd love to see more all electric range, a bigger battery to get you again that 55 to 60 kilometers, which is a sweet spot. So, again, with these colder temperatures, I'm getting about 30 kilometers of all electric range uh, on a normal day. So, I'm able to get to work a little bit on the way back, that kind of uh, scenario. So your mileage is gonna vary. So let's say you, you're driving a little bit more than I am and you're utilizing the fuel a lot more than you are the EV mode or utilizing the engine. You could still probably save you know, 30 to 40% of your driving uh, instead of utilizing gas or fuel, you would utilize electricity. And that will be a substantial savings. And I'm gonna show some numbers here on the screen that'll talk about a little bit or that it will estimate you know what kind of savings the epa says that your annual fuel cost on this is only about fifteen hundred dollars or so whereas if i did some calculations going about twenty thousand kilometers here but right now we're around a dollar fifty a liter so that fifteen hundred is closer to probably twenty eight hundred or so dollars and by without utilizing any electricity at all you'd be paying probably around $4,200 for that. So, you know, uh, about $1,500 to, to almost $2,000 more than, than you would. So that, to me, is a good substantial savings. Now, these things aren't cheap, right? From pricing perspective, this uh, trim level uh, MSRP starts at $80,000 Canadian and adding, and this has a lot of goodies and a lot of optional equipment to take it to $91,565. So over 15 grand in options. Again, your mileage is going to vary on the price, but you know we're talking a ninety-plus thousand-dollar vehicle. So I, you'd have to look at how this compares to the ICE version. I'm um, usually they're about eight to ten thousand dollars more for the plug-in hybrid versions of a same vehicle. So if I'm saving about two thousand to two hundred twenty-five hundred a year on fuel costs because I'm plugging it in every night, because my charging, folks, is dirt cheap. You know, for me to plug this in and get seventeen kilowatts back. Gee, that's like something, that's not even, a, like it's $1.20 or something like that. It's so cheap. To, and then to go, you know, that 30 to 40 kilometers on a buck, basically, um, because our, our hydro here is pretty cheap. It's not really a big factor. So the fuel savings uh, that, you'll, in, that you'll have by plugging this in every night, if, if you get into that routine, again, you gotta be constant with it. You'll make that difference that you pay for this vehicle versus the non-plug-in hybrid vehicle version of it, you'll make that eight to ten thousand dollars back in about let's say four to five years as a return on that investment. Um, so think about those numbers. You know, not just the out-of-the-box pricing, but if I'm going to keep this car for a while and I'm going to drive it and use it and you know uh, have a growing family or whatever the needs are, think about the cost savings there because once you when, you know once you've recoup the, the extra money that you've spent for the plug-in hybrid, you're now saving a lot more than you would as well every year versus just all gas. So that's kind of where I lean towards plug-in hybrids and that's the math and that's kind of the, some of the um, information that I think that you should take away from looking at a plug-in hybrid vehicles that are capable. You know, would I recommend this vehicle? Absolutely I recommend it. Uh, you know, with a little bit of hesitancy in the fact that you really need to look if this is a vehicle that you need for your use case. Um, and if you have the ability to plug it in even to a 110, it doesn't need to be a specialized machinery or, or a level two system. If you have that capability, this will work for you because you, it doesn't need a long time. Again, 12 hours to get fully charged to get that 20 some odd miles of range back. Doesn't sound like a lot of range, but over the course of time, doing that on a daily basis, you'll start recuperating that savings. So I hope that that's beneficial to you. Um, again, I do thank Jeep for loaning me uh, this press vehicle. It's a very comfortable vehicle. 
it's just big, you know, for, for us and for me, it's a big vehicle, uh, something that we don't need as a family, but I'm sure it has a lot of use cases. It has a ton of other capabilities from, from med you know, light to medium off-road capabilities. It's got some serious things. And, you know, one of the things some adventurous like is that you can take this to an off-road site, charge it, uh, let's say you're camping and then go off-roading in silence because you might do five or 10 kilometers in off-roading. You can do this all in all electric. It's very kind of a serene feeling when you're off-roading in the forest and you're not making much sound other than the wheels on the ground. So again, uh, something to look at and I hope that this was beneficial for you. And, you know, thanks for watching this episode of the EV Revolution Show. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I'd love to hear your comments uh, about this vehicle. And if you have one, I'd love to hear some feedback as well from where you're going. You know, from a competitor, there's not, you know, this is a, a, an interesting class because there are all electric SUVs. They tend to be a little bit more money, so you have to look.